Well, here we are, Wednesday again, on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. So welcome everybody out there in our viewer audience. And before I forget it, happy Thanksgiving to everybody, which is like tomorrow. So anyway, I'm uh, very pleased to have my good friend, uh, Toby Kincaid, beaming in uh, by sound today from uh, Portland, Oregon. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, topic of our conversation today is going to be um, wise path to 100% clean energy. And uh, is there a silver bullet? And the thing I love about Toby is he really thinks out of the box. He's a very uh, deep thinker, but he can also talk to, you know, general public. Um, and it's not like overly scientific. I'm not saying that in a negative way, because he is quite scientific, actually, with several patents and ideas behind his name. But Basically, he can talk to the, uh, you know, the working person out there on the street, and you can actually understand what he's talking about. So, Toby, let's uh, start off by just giving a 30-second background on who you are and what you do, and then we'll launch into our show. Well, wow, thank you, Mitch. Aloha from Portland, and happy Thanksgiving. Uh, I, uh, I go way back. I started as an optics lab. And uh, we were looking at how to take the optical resource of solar energy and break it into components. You have the infrared, which is great for thermal. Right. You have the visible, which is great for photovoltaics. And then you have the uh, ultraviolet, which is great for photochemistry. So I started in optics. I, I became uh, very early in my life a true believer when I saw what solar energy could do to uh, allow people to live any way they wanted to without any damage, without any carbon, without any footprint, without any toxicity. Right. And uh, that kind of got me rolling. And I remember uh, when we first met, it was in uh, almost 30 years ago in, in yeah, Washington, right. D.C. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And I, I remember you so well because uh, when I first met you, I thought, you know, look at this guy. He's putting in high, high power hydrogen fuel cell stacks into race cars. Right. And uh, when I saw you do that, Mitch, I thought, oh, hey, this is a good guy. So <laughs> Thanks, thank yeah. you for having me on. <laughs> yeah, I'm really pleased to have you on, too. So we've been in the hydrogen game for a long time, you and I. And uh, so I think yeah. our audience would really like to know about, you know, this, the subject matter or, or the thoughts behind uh, the title of our show today, Hawaii's Path to 100% Clean Energy. And so talk to us about, is there a silver bullet? So... I'll let you launch off, and if you want to see one of your slides, we, I know we have a slide deck. It's not death by PowerPoint. So just tell me when you want it. I know you can't see it on your end, but we want the audience to be able to see what you're talking about. So I'm going to let you cue the slides up, okay? Oh, you betcha. Uh, put the first one up. That'd be great. That's just kind of a, uh, the question. Okay, so you know, let's put the first uh, slide up. Hang I, on. Uh, Hang on. Okay, here you go. You, you bet. So, you know, in, in the many years, I've listened to many experts uh, from academia and from business and from government, and it always kind of bugged me that you often hear someone say, well, you know, this is a very complex problem, and of course, there is no silver bullet. And that kind of made me cringe a little bit. I mean, you know, how do you know? If you're looking for a silver bullet, how do you know if it exists or not? Right. So I set myself out to kind of answer that question. One, is there a silver bullet? And if there is, what does it actually look like? Right. So I thought, now, how can we do this? So if you pop to the second slide, right. I realized what I'll do is I'll make a list of everything we want. We want it to be non-toxic. We don't want soil or air or water pollution. We don't want biological pollution. We don't want volatile organic compounds or partially consumed hydrogen, hydrocarbons. We don't want mercury or, or particulates or, or NOx or SOx or acid rain. We don't want radiation. We want it to be safe, potent. It has to scale up to the industrial level, and that's really the tough part. It has to be available to everyone. We want it to be peaceful. We want an inherently low cost, so that's a minimum of rare earth elements if possible. We want no fuel cost. And it has to be robust and resilient and provide power at industrial scale everywhere and distributed on the earth. So can we put the now, hang on a second. That's just a short list. Yeah. Can we, yeah. Okay. 
I just wanted to make sure they had the slide back on because I think uh, we went off that too soon. So go ahead. The slide is now back okay, up. So you got this. Great, that's slide number two now, the silver bullet filter. Right. Yeah. So what I did is list everything that you want. And if you're picky, it's not tricky. I like so that expression. That area, <laughs> <laughs> so what I did on the left is, okay, let's take every combination of everything we know, every technology, and let's throw it at this, this barrier, mm -hmm. and let's see if anything gets through. So, you know, the world runs on fossil fuels, and yet here we are in 2019, solar panels. When you and I were starting out, solar panels were, you know, $16 a watt. Now they're 30 cents. Right. So it's come way down. Uh, you know, we've seen these in tremendous right. changes. So why don't we have a clean energy world? Right. What, what's the problem? So for me on the silver bullet, I listed this whole thing in an algorithm and then threw everything at it I could. Well, let me and just let me just stop. Let me just stop you right there. Can you put the slide back up, please, guys? Thanks. And listen, we'll let you know when we don't want it up anymore. So carry on. Yeah, Roger that. And so I, you look at fossil fuels that's running the world, mm -hmm. and we throw it into our barrier, and oops, it doesn't make it. It's soil pollution, air pollution, you know. And we frack and dig and scrape and drill for carbon fuels, to which the hydrogen is stuck to it. So it's not even the carbon that we want. Right. Uh, we have railroads and pipelines and refineries and depots, and uh, we're moving all of this material around, and it's all based on holes in the ground surrounded by men with guns. <laughs> I love that. It, it, that doesn't make, <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. Right. So here we, so here we are. We have all these experts saying, well, you know, it's going to be a diversity of things. It's going to be a mix of things. But I, I don't really buy into that. To me, it's a horse race, and you can't ride three horses at the same time. You've got to pick a horse and ride it to the end. Right. So for me, it's what's our best horse. So you can see we threw fossil fuels. It didn't make it through our barrier. You take nuclear energy and, and try that, and that doesn't go. It's expensive. It, there's radiation danger. And Fukushima, you know, spewing 40 tons of polluted water, radioactive water into the ocean every day. Yeah, but, really bad news. What about the new, so, or, hang on a minute, so I want to not mm -hmm. challenge you, but just bring out this topic a little bit no, more. Please. So what about the newer, you know, nuclear technologies that are coming out, like uh, breeder reactors and thorium reactors and all that, which people claim are now a lot safer than the uh, ones we've had to date? Well, it, even if we manage to make it safe, the materials uh, uh, are expensive. And, right. and it's still just a heat engine. Right. You're, you're still running a steam engine, basically, and, and that has limited efficiency. Right. Uh, we'll get to the fuel cells, but they're much more efficient than a steam engine. So the world has to not live in the 1800s anymore. We live in the 21st century. And so the point of this kind of trying to find the silver bullet was to throw all of these things and see what goes through. Okay. Now, on my list, you'll see a lithium-ion battery. Right. Well, there's a problem. There's a problem with lithium-ion when you talk about the industrial scale. Mm -hmm. You know, just in the quick physics, the, the amount of energy you can store in a lithium-ion battery is about 300 watts per kilogram, watt-hours per kilogram. Right. Well... All right. With the same amount of material in hydrogen, for example, we can store 40,000. Right. So as far as the amount of material you have, uh, hydrogen really shines because, you know, just one, uh, well, one kilowatt hour on your bill, thousand of those is called a megawatt hour, and that's right. what usually wholesale energy is sold in. Right. And if you did that with lithium ion, you would need three and a half tons of lithium ion to do one megawatt hour. Wow. And in reality, imagine your, imagine your smartphone. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy. You take out your little lithium ion battery in your smartphone. Imagine throwing that into a bucket. And how many would you have to throw in until you've got the three and a half tons? A lot. <laughs> the amount of them. A lot. It, it, it's not really very practical. Right. But when, when you need you know, 5,000 megawatt hours in a day of storage, and that'll just do a third of your, of your total load, 
you can see that, my goodness, we, it, it's, it's, we're talking about 5,000 times three and a half tons right. on your little island of, of 27 miles from the side. Yeah, and what about no, the cost? It, it's not going to fly. How much would that three tons the, cost? Well, there you go. One kilowatt hour in lithium is about $600. Right. So if you had a thousand, that would be six hundred thousand dollars of capital expense to give you uh, what sells in the California energy market for about you know twenty eight bucks. Right. So it's really hard to pencil that out to, right. to uh, have any any idea that that's going to work. And then what happens so, to the lithium when in the battery is like dead, like it self discharges? It only has so many charge cycles. So what about the lithium itself? What do we do with it? Well, there's a good point. I mean, we can recondition some of it, but look at the capital expense. And once you put in these batteries after five years, 10 years, whatever it is, you've got to replace the whole thing. Right. <laughs> it's just not going to fly. Okay. So when we look at, uh, at the, from an economic standpoint and, and the, the idea of industrial use of, of energy, so when we look at all of these things and we throw them through our silver bullet filter, I'm amazed that only one thing really gets through, and that is renewable hydrogen. And this is what you've been doing for, for so long. You've demonstrated that renewable hydrogen is different than hydrogen in, in, in general. Hydrogen usually is formed from methane, and that's 95% of the world. So right. what's particular about renewable hydrogen is that we're making it from renewables as the front end, and we're going to produce it from water. So we don't need fossil fuels, forget the methane, forget any carbon at all, right. and just go directly to water. And so um, that's what's really kind of driving this is that through my filter, the only thing that got through was uh, using renewables to make hydrogen, and that's where we have the electrolyzers and fuel cells. Awesome. And, and I'd like to kind of... Um, go into what that really means. I mean, a lot of people aren't familiar with electrolyzers, right. fuel cells. So what we've got is, if you, if, for example, if you took a metal spring uh, and you stretched it with solar panels, that you're putting energy in, you're going to stretch that spring out, and you're going to hook both ends, and then when you need energy, you unhook it, and it swings back, it, it right. goes back as the spring releases that energy, and you're left with the spring. Very nice. No chemistry, no radiation. It's just spring. Right. So now we're going to do the same thing with water. Okay. You're going to have water. You're going to stretch it with the electrolyzer. It's going to separate the gases and hold them apart. You can let the oxygen go into the air. It'll, it'll be just fine there. You can bring it back through the air when you run it through the fuel cell. And this is what the fuel cell does. It's the other side of it. It takes those gases and snaps them back like our spring through the fuel cell releasing the energy that you used originally, most of it, right. and returning most of the material back to water. Right. So since you're mostly made of water and the earth is mostly covered with water, isn't it extraordinary that the answer to sustainable industrial civilization is based on water? So should we be on the next slide, Toby? Yeah, let's, let's, let's grab the next one and I'll, and I'll kind of kind of fill out what that looks so, like. So before you do that, we have to stop for a break right now. But I just want to oh, remind sure. the audience that I told you that he could appeal to uh, you know, the non-academic community with his really interesting way of describing these phenomena, like the spring idea of how it snaps back and you know, releases the energy that you've stored up by stretching the spring. So we're going to carry on in about a minute's time and uh, after this break, short break. Aloha, everyone. I'm Christine Linders, and this is Think Tech Hawaii. My show is Movement Matters, and this is a show brought to you to talk about how to get rid of things like your low back pain, scoliosis, PMJ dysfunction, ankle sprains, pretty much anything that you can do with your body or hurt your body, I am here to bring to you the cutting edge strategies that you can do right now easily on your own to help get out of pain and get back to doing what you love. Life is better when you listen to your physical therapist. Tune in Tuesdays at 11 a.m. every other week for Movement Matters. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Duration. You are watching Think Tech Hawaii. I will be hosting a show here every other Wednesday 
at 1 p.m. And we will be talking to a lot of experts and guests around sustainability, social justice, the future here in Hawaii, progressive politics, and a whole lot more. So please tune in and thank you for watching Think Tech Hawaii. Okay, we're back from our short break, and I've got Toby Kincaid all the way with the magic of today's uh, communications from uh, Portland, Oregon. What's the weather there like, Toby? I hope it's miserable it's and dark. Freezing. Yay, I love it when you talk about that. I won't tell you, it's like 78 here, and nice breezy winds, and awesome, like, like the picture you're seeing. So anyway, let's carry on, and um, let's look at that sure. slide that we uh, had up there. There, that's the one, the electron engine. So. You want to uh, walk us through that again and reinforce what you were right. talking so, about before? Absolutely. So here I made a picture of it, and I call it an electron engine. And I do that because, you know, what does a steam engine run on? Steam. Steam. <laughs> <laughs> what does a gasoline engine run on? Uh, gasoline. Gas. How am I doing so far? <laughs> right. yeah. You're doing great. So now, what is an electron engine? Well... An electron engine has an input and an output. It runs on electrons that come in. Elect, that's the left side of your, of your uh, graph. Right. So we have renewable energy. It doesn't matter if it's variable or intermittent. If you've got lemons, we're going to make lemonade. Right. It goes into this electrolyzer. So what we can do with the grid is take all the renewable energy that's now being turned off because you're over-energizing your grid. Right. I say build out all the solar you want. Any renewable that you want, just do it all come. You have square miles of parking lots. You have many commercial rooftops, and of course, many residential. I say go for it. We take every drop of that, we run it into the electrolyzer, and that, as we explained, takes water and separates it into the gases. We're right. going to let the oxygen go for the moment. We'll store the hydrogen, and we, you, they just dry it, filter it, and then pump it into a tank. Right. And the hydrogen, because it's, it's lighter than air, is the ultimate in safety. Because if you ever had a breach, it goes straight up. It's up and out and gone. And, and how fast does it go up? Many times. How quickly does it, it goes escape? Up about six. Yeah, it's, it's fast. About as fast as you could shoot an arrow. It's about six stories a second. Yeah. And so, so that's out. just natural. If you just, like, release it out of your hand, it goes up that fast. But if, then if you have it under any kind of pressure, it's just going to shotgun up there, right? Absolutely. And in fact, they found with the pressure tanks, they're so safe. They tried to crush them. They tried to shoot them with handguns. They finally used a long rifle to penetrate one of these new composite tanks. Yeah. And the, the pressure blew the hydrogen out so fast, it's actually faster than the combustion wave front. Right. So if it ever was lit, it would blow itself out and, and go up and out, and it's gone. Right. And an illustration of the safety is if you had a tank of of propane, and at, over here a tank of hydrogen, if you lit a cigarette next to that propane tank, I'd say put that light out. Because if you ever had a breach, it's heavier than air, that propane's going to mix in and looking for a light, it's going to, you know, kabloomy. Right. Now, if you were smoking a cigarette next to a hydrogen tank, I'd say, hey, you shouldn't smoke, it's not good for you. But I would never worry about safety because I know in the physics, that hydrogen can never go two feet to the side right. to reach your cigarette. It goes straight up so fast. Right. Okay, so back to our power block. So we make the hydrogen from the electrolyzer. We store it. And then you can see to the right, you can just uh, pipe it over to a hydrogen dispenser. And you can fill the, the fuel cell buses, the fuel cell cars. Oh, wait, no, we're not on that. I forgot which diagram. We're on the first one, right? We're on the, the electron uh, the, engine. The electron engine. Yeah. All right, wait, let me, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Okay, so in this cycle, just as we talked about, we put energy in one side, that's the electrolyzer, separates into the gases, and then for the hydrogen. When you need energy, you just bring them back together, you snap back together through the fuel cell, and that's the other side of the cookie. Right. That gives you now a whole cookie. You have a battery now, essentially. Right. And, uh, and if you go, actually go ahead to the next slide, and this slide, we're going to actually use our electron engine in a real case. You've got the grid, you build out all your solar, you absorb it, you deliver it to our power block as much as you can, as much as you have. The electrolyzer then breaks into hydrogen and oxygen, the oxygen you let go. 
the hydrogen we're going to store, and that hydrogen you can pipe over to the dispensers so you can fill your buses, your cars, your trucks, farming equipment, construction equipment. This is where hydrogen really just shines. Right. Because there's so much energy there, you can actually do physical work, which is what we need. So now here's the fun twist. Now, if you look at our power block, I'm adding the fuel cell, not only in the vehicles, but I'm putting it in the power block as well. And the reason is, now we can take that hydrogen, goes to the fuel cell, makes the electricity that we can send over to the fast charge stations for your electric cars. Right. And in this way, it never touches the grid. So if someone wants to charge their car at peak time, no problem. Right. They can go directly from the hydrogen and we energize those dispensers. And then the really neat part is, as well, is if the system operator who runs the grid says, hey, it's 7 o'clock and everyone's cooking right now, we need more energy, then the electrolyzer could actually make electricity and push it back onto the grid. Right. So now we have a total grid balance solution. We right. have uh, hydrogen fuels for the big engines and for transportation. And... Uh, and for, uh, with the fuel cells, we can run the uh, electric vehicle charging. And so we have now a complete uh, unit that we could apply to almost any situation. You can scale this up and down. And that was so important about the silver bullet. It has, you know, what works on a bench top or in a, a laptop or a cell phone right. is not, that doesn't mean it'll work in, in, a, in a bus. Right. <laughs> when you talk about big energy demand, it's hydrogen that wins the day. Exactly. Okay. So, uh, for example, if I were the uh, emperor of Hawaii, one of the first things I'd say is, okay, we're going to take your dirtiest energy, your coal power plants, you just a couple of them, and we're going to convert that to renewable hydrogen. And the great thing about that is, you, in that case, you don't even need the fuel cells necessarily. You could just make the hydrogen, modify your burners, burn the hydrogen, it just comes back to water. That's your only waste product. And now you can run the equipment. So you don't strand the asset. Right. A lot of the people concerned about getting off of carbon and fossil fuels are worried, well, we've got trillions of dollars into these assets and they're all going to be stranded. No, well, not really. You can use some of it. So what but do you say? So, so let me, just, just so I understand what you're yeah. saying, you're saying you basically you substitute hydrogen for the coal in the um, coal plant because you still want to use their steam turbines, correct? Is that, is that what you're saying? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So you could do that, but you don't have to tear the whole thing apart. And the footprint, you know, I did a, I did a survey of how much, is there enough solar energy to run Oahu? Right. And the fact is, there, there is. That solar energy, if you collect 10% of it, convert it to electricity, in one square mile, for it just to have a, a scale here, yeah. one square mile in one year, if the energy is 15 cents that you uh, export per kilowatt hour, that's worth $77 million a year. So in okay. 10 years, one square mile of sunlight in Hawaii has a value of at least $777 million. So that's, that's not bad. <laughs> so I tried, to, I tried to do a, a calculation. How, many, how much parking lot space do you have? Now, Oahu is not a big island. Right. But there's a million cars. It looks to me, I couldn't get the exact number, but you're well over two or three square miles of parking lot. So you literally have tens of millions of dollars of, of wealth falling down on your parking lots that are, that are wasted. Right. And the, so when I run through these numbers, I realize that, in fact, you can be completely energy independent. And it's so important that you achieve what you've been working for, uh, for the islands, that you all pull together and do this. Because if we save Hawaii, we save the world. If you're the, you're the cutting edge, you're the, 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 the tip of the spear. If, if, in fact, you're the bleeding edge. You're way out in front. And, right. and by lifting everyone up to what you are demonstrating, it's very easy to realize that we just don't need to burn fossil fuels anymore. Right. And holes in the ground surrounded by men with guns no longer is a paradigm that is sustainable for our world. Right. And so it's, a, it's amazing that we're, that, and your work is so important, Mitch, because you're, you're pointing out this is reality. This, this is not a fantasy. It doesn't require R&D. We know we have electrolyzers. We know we have fuel cells. 
Right. Fuel cells have come down in price because they're used a lot now for the material handling vehicles in the Amazon and FedEx and UPS. Right. All of those little trucks running around, those are hydrogen. And the reason is they can fill them up in, in one minute. Right. If it were batteries, it would take many, many hours and it would slow down their, their throughput. And similarly with buses, because I'm a, I'm a very big advocate of using hydrogen initially, because we're using taxpayers' dollars to kind of prime the pump here and get these systems out there, is uh, you know, like your buses can be refueled in a matter of you know, six or seven minutes, maybe 10 minutes at the max, um, just like a diesel bus. So it's the same experience. It's the same driver experience. He comes up to a dispenser, he plugs the hose in. In this case, it's a, a gas-tight fit, and it hits the little start button. The computer takes over, fills the bus. Like eight or nine minutes later, disconnects the hose, and then off he goes. And uh, so it's a perfect, it's a perfect thing. Uh, as opposed to like battery chargers, which you know everybody talks about the cost of the bus, like oh, it's like oh, much more expensive than a diesel bus. But do they factor in the cost of the battery charger that goes with it? Because depending on how fast right. you want to charge that bus, a battery charger can range from a couple of hundred thousand dollars to four hundred thousand dollars, and then you got to power that that uh, that uh, charger. So pretty soon the costs yeah, start mounting yeah, up, and then you have to look at your infrastructure. Can my grid support this kind of power level? And uh, cutting through with the hydrogen, yeah. uh, and that's the other reason that I, I put uh, power export units on our buses here, because like in an emergency, like if a, the, uh, a, a hurricane comes in and flattens the grid, we can use our buses as mobile power units and go and plug in a critical Fantastic. loads like communications or uh, shelters, hospitals, uh, drug stores to keep our drugs uh, um, cold, and uh, gas stations so they can actually pump gasoline. Uh, and everybody says, well, where are you going to get the electricity to pump the gasoline? Well, the bus can plug into the dispenser and pump its own. So um, the very big, uh, the civil defense people really like this idea, and I think it's, you know, we have to look at the total value proposition. It's not just comparing the cost of a diesel bus to the cost of a hydrogen bus. And right now, we don't even have economies of scale kicking in for uh, our buses. And once they start being mass produced, the prices are gonna fall dramatically. Oh, sorry, I don't mean to hog your, your show there. No, uh, no, no, no it's, it's a brilliant point because it, uh, emergencies are happening all the time. And, and the, the, your use of that at the deployable power supply is brilliant. And, and people, when they, when they are really going to need it, they're going to really appreciate that. Right. I also like your point about the charging cycle. This is a lot of, this is very important what you're saying. When you, and here in Portland, we have a, a, a transit authority called TriMet. And TriMet has a big fleet. There's like 660 buses. Wow. Now, if you did a battery electric bus, it's called a BEB, a battery electric means all battery. If, just as you said, uh, not only are you going to have a couple hours at least uh, if you could fast charge that bus, but the charging infrastructure to do that for one bus is very expensive. It's also a very high draw of power right. yeah. uh, on the order for the buses of 350 kilowatts. Yeah. Now, on Hawaii, <laughs> in Hawaii, your commercial uh, demand charge for Schedule G, if I remember correctly, is $24 per kilowatt. Now, this isn't the energy. This is the, the power, the peak power that you use. Yeah. Well, $24 times 350, that's quite a bit for one bus. Now, when you try and add many of them, it becomes really problematic. Yeah. So when you talk, you talk about refueling in five, seven minutes, that is not a small point. That is really critical to the controller who's going to actually try to figure out how am I going to charge right. 660 buses every day. On that happy so, note, you know, I, I, we need to wind up. So, like, oh. give me 10 seconds of closing comment, and then we've got to wind it down because we already blew through our 30 minutes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, the bottom line is the entire world runs on fossil fuels, and there's a lot of, of toxicity, there's a lot of violence, there's a lot of inequity. What the world really needs is to do what you have been showing us, Nick is that with renewable energy, making hydrogen, then you can store the energy when you need it and you have total freedom, total power, 
total ability to run any lifestyle you want and not hurt anyone. So I say bravo, bravo to your work and to the people and citizens of, of Hawaii. Thank you very much, Toby. We're going to have you back because I know you have a lot more to say. And so uh, this is Mitch Ewan from Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, signing off. And we'll see you next Wednesday. And enjoy your Thanksgiving. Aloha. Thank you.